In the dying days of World War II, as the Third Reich's grip crumbled and the Allied forces closed in, a single German unit, the 12th Army, made an unexpected decision that altered the course of many lives. Among them was Hauptmann Friedrich Müller, a man whose loyalty to his country was only eclipsed by his duty to his men and the innocent lives caught in the crossfire. This is the story of a harrowing escape, a treacherous journey through a country ravaged by war, and the unlikely path to redemption. It's a tale of honor amidst chaos, humanity in the face of destruction, and the profound impacts of the choices we make. Follow Miller's journey as he navigates the perils of a nation in its darkest hour, seeking a glimmer of hope at the Elbe River, a crossing into a new dawn. The war was drawing to an inevitable, desperate close. Hauptmann Friedrich Müller stood in the dimly lit makeshift command post, a repurposed schoolroom somewhere south of Baylitz, its walls echoing the distant artillery thunder. Maps lay scattered on a table before him, each crease and fold marking the relentless advance of the Allied forces. Friedrich's eyes, weary from sleepless nights and constant vigilance, moved over the front-line markings, understanding all too well the grave situation at hand. General Walter Wink's 12th Army had been given an almost mythic task, to hold open a corridor to the west, a slender thread of hope for soldiers and civilians alike seeking refuge from the encroaching Soviet army. Friedrich's orders were clear yet daunting. He was to lead a mixed group, his remaining men, some battered remnants of the Ninth Army, and a throng of civilians, through the war-torn landscape to the relative safety of the American lines across the Elbe. As he folded the map, his fingers lingered on the paper, tracing the route that would lead them through the corridor. The corridor was more than just a route. It was a lifeline, a narrow passage snaking through a collapsing Reich, offering a chance of survival, a chance to avoid the feared Soviet captivity. Turning to his men, Friedrich saw a reflection of his own turmoil mirrored in their faces. They were soldiers of a vanquished army, young faces aged prematurely by war, eyes that had seen too much. Among them were medics, radio operators, and infantry, each with their own story of survival, each with their own longing gaze towards an elusive peace. Kameraden, Friedrich began, his voice steady despite the churn of emotions. The situation is dire, but our mission is clear. We must reach the Twelfth Army's corridor. It's not just about us. It's about the civilians, the wounded, the children. We have a duty to them as much as we have to our country. He paused, letting his words settle in the smoky air, punctuated by the distant rumble of the front. We will move under the cover of night, avoid main roads, and use the terrain to our advantage. Stay alert. Stay alive. Remember... Reaching the Elbe is our only chance. The men nodded, a mixture of determination and fear in their eyes. They had all heard the stories of what happened to those captured by the Soviets. The corridor to the Americans was not just a tactical retreat. It was a flight from a fate many considered worse than death. As the group prepared, gathering the meager supplies and ammunition they had left, Friedrich approached a civilian woman cradling her child. She looked up at him with a mixture of fear and hope. Hauptmann, will we be safe? she asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Friedrich knelt beside her, offering a reassuring smile. We will do everything in our power to get you to safety, he promised, knowing full well the perilous journey ahead. Stay close, follow our lead and keep your child quiet. We'll make it through. Night fell like a curtain over the scarred landscape, offering a brief respite from the aerial reconnaissance and the constant threat of enemy eyes. Under the cover of darkness, Friedrich led his group out of the command post, their shadows merging with the ruins as they began their march towards the corridor. 
The journey would be fraught with danger, but Friedrich's resolve was unyielding. He understood that in these final days of the war, it was no longer about grand strategies or victory. It was about survival, about preserving what little humanity remained amidst the ashes of a shattered world. As the group disappeared into the night, a silent determination filled the air, each step carrying them closer to the corridor, closer to the uncertainty of surrender, but also closer to the hope of survival. The Twelfth Army was holding the corridor open, but it was up to Friedrich and his band of soldiers and civilians to traverse the perilous path to freedom. The night was eerily quiet, broken only by the distant rumbles of a war that refused to concede its grip. Hauptmann Friedrich Müller led his contingent through the once familiar countryside, now a shadow of its former self. Trees stood like wounded sentinels, their branches bare, and buildings were mere skeletons, testaments to the relentless bombings that had scarred the land. The group moved cautiously, avoiding the main roads, their path illuminated by the moon's ghostly glow. Every so often, the silence was punctured by the distant cry of a child or the soft weeping of a woman, quickly hushed by anxious relatives. Friedrich knew that silence was their ally, and any sound could betray them to lurking enemies or opportunistic bandits. As dawn approached, the first light revealed the full extent of the destruction. The landscape was a tapestry of devastation, with craters pockmarking fields and the remains of homes dotting the horizon. The air carried the acrid scent of burnt wood and decay, a constant reminder of the war's pervasive reach. They reached a small village, its name long forgotten, a place that had been caught in the crossfire of advancing and retreating armies. Friedrich signaled for a brief halt, using the derelict buildings for cover as they assessed their surroundings. Scouts were sent ahead to ensure the path was clear, their return bringing a tense relief to the weary travelers. In the village, the group encountered others like themselves, a ragtag assembly of soldiers and civilians all moving in the same direction, all seeking the same salvation. Brief exchanges of information occurred, rumors of Soviet advances, stories of lost loved ones, and whispered hopes of what lay beyond the Elba. Friedrich noticed his men's morale wavering as fatigue set in. He addressed them with a firm yet empathetic tone. Rest now. We move out in ten minutes. Remember, many depend on us, and we must not fail them. As they rested, Friedrich's gaze fell upon a young soldier, no more than eighteen, clutching a tattered photograph. Approaching him, Friedrich asked, Who is that? The soldier looked up, his eyes momentarily brightening. My sister, sir. She's waiting for me in Hamburg. I promised I'd return. Friedrich placed a hand on the soldier's shoulder. And you will. Keep that promise close. It will carry you through. The brief respite ended all too quickly, and they resumed their journey, weaving through the labyrinth of destruction. Every step took them closer to the corridor, but also deeper into the heart of a land torn apart by years of conflict. Mid-morning found them navigating a dense forest, the trees providing a much-needed cover. The forest, untouched by the war's direct impact, seemed a different world, a stark contrast to the ravaged lands they had traversed. Birds chirped tentatively, and for a brief moment the war felt distant, an illusion that was quickly shattered by the sound of an engine in the sky, prompting them to blend into the undergrowth. The day wore on, each hour a test of endurance and resolve. Friedrich's thoughts often drifted to his own family, to the world that once was, but he quickly anchored himself back to the present, to the men and women who looked to him for guidance and protection. As evening approached, they reached the outskirts of another village. This time, they would not stop. The risk was too great. Friedrich's orders were clear. Keep moving eyes sharp. We're close now. The corridor lay just beyond, a gateway to the unknown. 
Friedrich knew the hardest part of their journey was yet to come. The final stretch would be the most dangerous, the most demanding. But as he led his group through the scorched earth of a dying war, there was a glimmer of hope, a sense that perhaps, just perhaps, they might make it after all. Dawn broke with a muted gray light filtering through the heavy clouds, casting long shadows over Hauptmann Friedrich Miller and his weary band. The landscape had shifted subtly as they moved closer to their goal, becoming increasingly marred by the scars of battle. The once orderly fields were now a jumbled mess of trenches, tank traps and debris from both the retreating German army and the advancing Soviets. Their next obstacle was a river, once a minor geographical footnote, now a significant barrier. The bridge that had spanned its banks, a vital link in their route, lay in ruins, collapsed into the water from a previous bombardment. The river itself was swollen from the spring rains, rushing past with a ferocity that spoke of danger. Friedrich surveyed the scene, his mind racing through the options. A crossing here was vital. Detouring could cost them precious time they didn't have, potentially exposing them to Soviet forces or leaving them trapped in a pincer movement. He called his lieutenants to him, their faces drawn and anxious. We need to find a way across, Friedrich stated, the urgency clear in his voice. Check upstream for any remnants of bridges or possible fording sites. Move quickly, but be discreet. We can't afford to draw any attention. As the men dispersed on their tasks, Friedrich turned his attention to the civilians. They were huddled together, fear and exhaustion etched into every face. Among them, he recognized the woman with her child from the day before. Her eyes met his, a silent plea for reassurance. We will cross safely, he told her, forcing confidence into his voice. Stay together and be ready to move quickly when the time comes. He left her side to oversee the preparations, his mind working through the logistics of the crossing. They would need to be swift and coordinated to prevent panic and ensure everyone made it to the other side. The scouts returned with news of a possible crossing point a few hundred meters upstream. It was not ideal, a narrow makeshift bridge of planks and debris, likely left by retreating soldiers or locals. It would be risky, but it was their only real option. Friedrich gathered his group, explaining the plan with calm authority. The soldiers would cross first, securing the other side and providing cover. Then the civilians would follow, one small group at a time to avoid overburdening the fragile bridge. The crossing began, a tense and precarious affair. The soldiers moved with disciplined speed, their training evident even in such dire circumstances. Once they had established a defensive position on the far bank, the first group of civilians began their cautious trek across the swaying bridge. Friedrich watched each person step onto the makeshift structure, holding his breath as it creaked and swayed under their weight. He helped steady the elderly, carried children, and offered words of encouragement to those frozen by fear. Midway through the crossing, disaster struck. A plank gave way under the feet of a young woman, sending her plunging into the rushing waters below. Without hesitation, Friedrich and two soldiers dove in after her, fighting the current to bring her back to safety. The incident shook the group, but Friedrich's quick action and the woman's rescue bolstered their resolve. They finished the crossing with even greater care, each person reaching the far bank a personal victory against the war's relentless cruelty. As the last of the civilians set foot on solid ground, Friedrich allowed himself a moment of relief. They were across, but there was no time to rest. The journey to the corridor was far from over, and every minute they lingered increased the risk of discovery. Regrouping, they set off once again, their path leading them ever closer to the 12th Army's corridor. Friedrich knew the hardest trials might yet lie ahead, but the successful crossing had given them all a renewed sense of determination. 
They were survivors. Each step forward a defiance of the war that sought to claim them. And as long as they had breath and strength, they would continue to fight for every chance of life and freedom. The group continued their journey, their pace quickened by the looming threat of capture and the need to reach the American lines. The day's march was grueling, with the path often winding through dense, untamed woods and over rugged terrain, further draining their already dwindling energy. As the sun began its descent, casting a golden hue over the landscape, Friedrich recognized the signs of exhaustion in his companions and knew they must rest. He chose a secluded glade for their temporary camp, a place where the trees formed a natural barrier and the soft murmur of a nearby stream promised a chance to replenish their water supplies. The soldiers set about creating a perimeter while civilians collapsed onto the ground, their faces showing the toll of the relentless march. Friedrich's orders were clear. This was to be a brief rest, a few precious hours to gather their strength before they continued. No fires were to be lit, no unnecessary noise made. The risk of attracting enemy attention was too great. As the group settled, Friedrich took a moment to walk amongst them, offering words of encouragement and ensuring that the most vulnerable were attended to. He stopped by a small family huddled together, the mother quietly comforting her children with hushed lullabies. He offered them his water flask, receiving a grateful smile in return. Despite the brief nature of their stop, the respite brought a semblance of calm. Soldiers shared their rations, breaking the hard bread and passing around tins of food while medics tended to blistered feet and minor injuries. In the fading light, the group seemed less like a military unit and more like a community, united by their shared ordeal. Friedrich found himself beside the stream, watching as the water flowed past, uncaring of the human strife surrounding it. His thoughts drifted to his own family, to the world that had been before the war. He wondered what they were doing at that very moment, whether they were safe. A voice interrupted his reverie. It was one of his men, Klaus, a young radio operator who had shown remarkable bravery during their journey. Hauptmann, you should rest too. We need you strong, Klaus said, his face showing concern. Friedrich nodded, knowing the truth in the young soldier's words. Soon, Klaus, I just need a moment. As darkness enveloped the glade, the group settled into an uneasy sleep their bodies too tired to resist the pull of slumber. Friedrich, however, remained awake, his senses attuned to the slightest sound, his mind ever vigilant. After what seemed like hours, but was likely only a few minutes, he finally allowed himself to lean against a tree, his eyes closing just for a moment. In that brief lull, the war seemed to recede, giving way to a peace that he knew was fleeting but cherished nonetheless. The night passed without incident, a rare gift in these turbulent times. As the first light of dawn broke through the canopy, Friedrich roused his companions. They dismantled their makeshift camp with practiced efficiency, leaving no trace of their presence. They set off once more, their steps resolute. The moment of reprieve had given them a renewed sense of purpose, a reminder of what they were fighting for, not for victory, not for glory, but for the chance to see another day, to return to their loved ones, to rebuild from the ashes of a world torn apart. And with each step, the corridor held by the Twelfth Army drew nearer, a beacon of hope in a world darkened by war. The dawn's light crept hesitantly across the land, as if reluctant to reveal the scars of war that marred the German countryside. The group, led by Hauptmann Friedrich Miller, continued their trek towards the corridor, their movements swift and silent, a ghostly procession weaving through the remnants of a shattered world. As they neared the vicinity of the corridor, the signs of war intensified. The ground was churned up by the tracks of tanks and vehicles, and the air was thick with the stench of smoke and decay. 
The once distant rumble of artillery was now a constant companion, a grim reminder of the battle raging just beyond their sight. Friedrich knew that this stretch of their journey would be the most perilous. The corridor was heavily contested, a narrow strip of land brutally fought over by both German and Soviet forces. To reach it, they would have to navigate a gauntlet of enemy patrols, minefields, and the ever-present threat of aerial bombardment. The group pressed on, their eyes constantly scanning the horizon for danger. Every rustle of leaves or distant shout put them on edge, their nerves stretched taut by the constant strain. Suddenly, a shout rang out from the front of the column. Friedrich's heart sank as he sprinted forward, arriving just in time to see one of his scouts gesturing frantically towards a nearby hill. Through his binoculars, Friedrich saw the unmistakable shapes of Soviet soldiers setting up a machine gun nest, their eyes trained on the path the group would need to take. Quickly, he ordered his men to take cover, their bodies pressing into the earth as they sought to make themselves invisible to the enemy. Friedrich's mind raced as he considered their options. A frontal assault was suicide, but retreating would take them directly into the path of another Soviet unit. It was then that Klaus, the young radio operator, approached him with a determined look in his eyes. Hauptmann, I think I can help, he said, holding out a small, jury-rigged device. I've been tinkering with this. It's a decoy transmitter. It might not fool them for long, but it could give us the distraction we need. Friedrich hesitated for a moment, then nodded. Do it, he ordered, understanding that they had little choice. Klaus set to work, his fingers deftly adjusting the device before setting it off into the woods, away from their intended route. The group waited with bated breath as the transmitter began to emit a series of false radio signals designed to mimic the chatter of a larger force. As hoped, the Soviet soldiers took the bait, their attention momentarily diverted by the phantom threat. Seizing the opportunity, Friedrich led his group in a wide arc around the enemy position, their movements quick and silent. The diversion worked, but they were far from safe. The landscape became a maze of hazards, with every step carrying the risk of death or discovery. Mines claimed the lives of two soldiers, their sacrifices a grim reminder of the unforgiving nature of their journey. But through it all, Friedrich's leadership remained steadfast, his presence a source of strength for the weary travelers. He moved among them, offering words of encouragement his resolve unbroken even as the weight of their situation threatened to crush him. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, they reached the outskirts of the corridor. The sound of battle was deafening here, a cacophony of gunfire and explosions that filled the air with chaos and death. Yet amidst the violence, there was a sense of hope. The corridor lay open before them, a narrow path to salvation, held by the battered but unbroken 12th Army. They had made it through the gauntlet, but their journey was far from over. With a grim determination, Friedrich led his group forward, their eyes fixed on the horizon, their spirits buoyed by the knowledge that they were one step closer to the Elba, one step closer to the end of their ordeal. The corridor was within reach, and with it, the chance for a new beginning free from the horrors of war. The group emerged into the corridor, a tumultuous scene of frantic movement and desperate hope. The Twelfth Army, though battered and bruised, stood firm, creating a fragile but vital passage through which soldiers and civilians alike streamed towards the Elba. The sounds of battle were close, a harrowing reminder that the Soviet Army was pressing hard on their heels. Hauptmann Friedrich Miller surveyed the scene, his heart heavy with the weight of responsibility. He knew that the corridor would not hold for long. They needed to move quickly and efficiently to avoid being engulfed by the fighting or overtaken by the enemy. He ordered his group to form up, arranging them into a makeshift column with the soldiers on the outside, protecting the civilians within. 
His voice was firm as he addressed them. Stay close, move fast, and follow my lead. The corridor is our best chance, but it is also a dangerous place. Be alert and be ready to defend yourselves if necessary. The group began to move, their progress slow but steady as they navigated through the mass of humanity. All around them, the signs of war were evident, the wounded being carried on makeshift stretchers, the lost children crying for parents who might never answer, the hollow-eyed soldiers marching towards an uncertain fate. Despite the chaos, there was an underlying current of solidarity. Soldiers from different units helped one another, Civilians shared their meager supplies with strangers, and everyone worked together to move as many people as possible toward safety. As they progressed, Friedrich noticed a group of soldiers from the Ninth Army, recognizable by their distinct insignia. They were in a dire state, their uniforms tattered and their faces gaunt with exhaustion. One of them, a young lieutenant, approached Friedrich. Hauptmann! We've been cut off from our unit, he explained, his voice raw with fatigue. Can we join your group? Friedrich nodded, understanding all too well the desperation in the man's eyes. Stay close and keep up. We're all aiming for the same thing, survival. The addition of the Ninth Army soldiers bolstered their numbers, and they continued onward, inching closer to the Elba with every step. But as they moved, the sounds of battle grew louder and the air was filled with the acrid smell of smoke and gunpowder. Suddenly, without warning, a shell exploded nearby, sending a shower of dirt and debris over the group. Screams and shouts filled the air as everyone dropped to the ground, seeking cover from the unseen enemy. Friedrich was on his feet in an instant, barking orders and trying to maintain order amidst the panic. Stay down. Protect the civilians. Return fire only if you have a clear target. The soldiers, trained for moments like this, responded with discipline, their actions measured and precise despite the chaos. But the civilians were another matter, their fear threatening to erupt into a full-blown panic. It was then that Friedrich saw her, the woman with the child, huddled against a fallen log, her body shaking with terror. He crawled over to her, placing his body between her and the direction of the enemy fire. Stay down, he urged, his voice calm and reassuring. It will pass. Just stay down and keep your child close. The barrage continued for what seemed like an eternity, but eventually the explosions moved away, chasing after some other target. Friedrich helped the woman to her feet checking to make sure she and her child were unharmed. Around them, the group was slowly regrouping, their faces grim but determined. They had survived this test, but there would be others. The corridor was a gauntlet of its own, a perilous path lined with danger at every turn. But as they resumed their march, there was a renewed sense of purpose in their steps. They had come too far to give up now. The Elba was close, and with it, the promise of safety and the end of their long ordeal. They would make it, Friedrich vowed silently to himself. They had to. The corridor's relative safety soon gave way to the open expanse leading towards the Elba. Hauptmann Friedrich Müller and his weary band could feel the breath of freedom on their necks, Yet the pressing danger from the encroaching Soviet forces reminded them that their journey was far from over. The corridor had been a chaotic mix of hope and despair, and now, as they left its relative protection, they stepped into the unknown, betwixt the hope of surrendering to the Americans and the fear of Soviet capture. The landscape opened up before them, a patchwork of fields and scattered woods leading to the river. The Elba, a ribbon of silver in the distance seemed deceptively peaceful, belying the deadly struggle that raged around its banks. The air was tense with anticipation, each step forward fraught with danger as both German deserters and Soviet patrols could emerge at any moment. Friedrich's eyes constantly scanned the horizon, his senses attuned to the slightest sign of danger. The soldiers, 
their faces set in grim determination, moved with a quiet efficiency, their training evident even in their exhaustion. And the civilians, their trust placed wholly in the soldiers' protection, followed closely, their expressions a mix of fear and hope. As they neared the river, the sound of battle grew louder, a cacophony of gunfire and artillery that spoke of the fierce fighting between the retreating German forces and the advancing Soviets. Friedrich knew they needed to avoid the main crossing points, which would be heavily contested, and seek a quieter place to make their passage. He led the group towards a narrower part of the river, where the ruins of an old farmhouse provided a temporary shelter. Here, they paused, taking a moment to gather their strength and plan their final approach to the river. Friedrich met with his lieutenants, quickly sketching out a strategy. We'll need to cross in small groups to avoid drawing attention. Civilians and wounded first, then the soldiers. Keep your weapons ready, but don't engage unless absolutely necessary. Our goal is to reach the other side, not get dragged into a fight. The group nodded, understanding the stakes. Each of them knew that this was the final hurdle, the last few meters that stood between them and the end of their journey. As the first light of dawn broke over the river, they began their crossing. Small groups of civilians, helped by the soldiers, made their way cautiously down to the water's edge, where makeshift rafts and the few remaining boats ferried them across the narrow stretch of water. Friedrich watched each group make their way across, his heart in his throat as he waited for the moment when the enemy would discover them. But fortune, it seemed, was on their side. The crossing proceeded with a tense but successful rhythm, each group reaching the far bank to be met by the outstretched hands of their comrades. Then, as the last of the civilians were ferried across and the soldiers prepared to follow, disaster struck. A flare shot up into the sky from the direction of the main crossing, its bright light casting a stark illumination over the river. Within moments, the sound of engines roared to life, and a Soviet patrol boat rounded the bend, its guns trained on the small group still waiting to cross. Friedrich's mind raced. They were so close, yet now it seemed as if all would be lost. He shouted orders, directing the soldiers to provide cover fire while the remaining civilians and wounded were hurried onto the last of the rafts. The air was filled with the sound of gunfire and shouting. The once peaceful riverbank turned into a scene of desperate struggle. Friedrich fired his weapon, each shot a calculated risk as he provided cover for his men. And then, as suddenly as it had begun, the firing stopped. The patrol boat, hit by a well-aimed shot, drifted away, its threat neutralized. The last of the group made their way across the river, their hearts pounding with a mix of fear and exhilaration. As Friedrich stepped onto the far bank of the Elba, he allowed himself a moment to take it all in. They had made it. They were safe, at least for the moment. Ahead of them lay the American lines, and with them, the promise of an end to the fighting, the end of their long journey. But even as he felt the relief wash over him, Friedrich knew that the war's scars would not heal easily. They had survived, but the memories of what they had seen and done would stay with them forever. For now, though, they were alive, and in the aftermath of such a brutal conflict, that was enough. The final stretch to the Elba had been fraught with peril, but as Hauptmann Friedrich Miller and his charges stood on the western bank, the reality of their situation began to sink in. The river's expanse represented more than a physical barrier. It was the line between past horrors and future uncertainties, between the world they knew and a world yet to be rebuilt. The opposite bank was a scene of organized chaos, with American soldiers moving efficiently to process the surrendering German troops and civilians. The sound of battle had receded here, replaced by the murmur of voices and occasional commands barked out by officers. The American flag fluttered in the breeze, a symbol of the new authority in this small corner of a war-torn continent. 
Friedrich's group was exhausted, their faces etched with fatigue and relief. The civilians clung together, their eyes wide as they took in their surroundings, while the soldiers stood quietly, their weapons discarded, their demeanor that of men who had finally laid down an unbearable burden. As they approached the American checkpoint, Friedrich stepped forward, his uniform still bearing the insignia of the German army, but his hands raised in a universal gesture of surrender. An American officer approached, his expression wary but not unkind. We wish to surrender, Friedrich said in English, his voice steady despite the emotion welling up inside him. My men and these civilians seek your protection. The officer nodded, signaling for his men to begin processing the group. As the soldiers and civilians were led away to be registered and attended to, Friedrich remained where he was, the reality of his situation finally settling in. He was no longer a commander, no longer a soldier of the Reich. He was a prisoner of war, his future uncertain, his fate in the hands of his former enemies. He watched as his men were searched and their personal items confiscated, each one passing him with a nod or a whispered word of thanks. They were alive, and for now, that was enough. As the last of his group was led away, Friedrich turned to face the river once more. The Elba, once a mere geographical feature, had become a symbol of so much more. It represented the end of a long and painful journey, the end of a brutal and devastating war. But it also represented a beginning, the first tentative steps towards rebuilding and reconciliation. He thought of the men and women he had led, of the sacrifices they had made, and the horrors they had endured. He thought of the country he had served, now broken and defeated, its future uncertain. And he thought of his own path, the choices he had made, and the ones still to be made. As he was escorted away, Friedrich took one last look at the river, its waters flowing calmly as if to wash away the scars of war. He knew that the road ahead would be difficult, that the memories of what he had seen and done would haunt him for the rest of his days. But as he walked towards the unknown, he carried with him a glimmer of hope, a belief that, from the ashes of conflict, a better world could emerge. And with that thought in his heart, Friedrich Müller crossed the Elbe, leaving behind the war and stepping into the pages of history. Hauptmann Friedrich Müller stood quietly in line with his men, now disarmed and waiting for the American soldiers to process them. The atmosphere was heavy with a mix of relief, defeat, and apprehension about what lay ahead. Friedrich's uniform, once a source of pride, now felt like a weight, its insignia a reminder of the devastating war that had just ended. One by one, each man was called forward. Names and ranks were taken, personal items confiscated. When it was Friedrich's turn, he met the gaze of the American officer, a young lieutenant with clear, scrutinizing eyes. Friedrich Müller, Hauptmann, he stated, his voice devoid of emotion. The lieutenant nodded, marking something on the clipboard before him. Friedrich was then directed towards a holding area where other German officers were gathered. As he walked, Friedrich looked back at his men, now intermingled with hundreds of other German soldiers. They looked lost, uncertain, their futures as unclear as the sky above. The civilians, too, were being cared for by military medics and personnel from humanitarian organizations. Despite the end of conflict, their expressions bore the deep scars of war, the knowledge that their lives would never be the same. In the holding area, officers from various units exchanged quiet words, their conversation a mix of speculation about their fate and reflections on the war. Friedrich remained mostly silent, his thoughts turned inward. He thought about the men he had lost, the decisions he had made, and the tumultuous path that had led him here. Days turned into weeks as the process of demobilization and repatriation began. 
The POW camp was a liminal space, a place of waiting filled with the uncertainty of what peace would bring. Friedrich and his fellow officers were interrogated, their roles and actions during the war scrutinized. It was a time of reckoning, of facing the consequences of a war that had engulfed the world. Gradually, news trickled in from the outside. Germany lay in ruins, its cities devastated, its people facing a long and difficult road to recovery. The political landscape was shifting, with old powers fallen and new ones rising. And amidst it all were the trials, the start of a process to bring those responsible for the war's atrocities to justice. For Friedrich, the days were long and filled with a deep sense of introspection. He thought about his family, wondering if they had survived and what life would be like when he finally returned. He thought about his country, its future uncertain, and the long process of healing and rebuilding that lay ahead. Eventually, the day came when Friedrich's name was called. He was to be repatriated, sent back to a Germany divided and occupied. As he left the camp, he felt a strange sense of dislocation, as if he were stepping into a completely different world. The journey home was long and arduous, but eventually Friedrich found himself standing before what remained of his family home. It was damaged, but still standing, a testament to the resilience of those who had endured the war. His family was there, their faces lined with the hardships of the past years, but alight with the joy of reunion. There were tears and embraces, stories of survival and loss. And as he stood there, surrounded by the remnants of his former life, Friedrich knew that the real journey was just beginning. The war had ended, but its legacy would live on, in the ruins of cities, in the memories of those who had lived through it, and in the collective conscience of a world determined never to let such a conflict happen again. For Friedrich, as for so many others, the task ahead was to rebuild, to find a way to heal the wounds of the past and to create a future that would honor the sacrifices of those who had been lost. And so, with a heart heavy with memories but buoyed by hope, Friedrich Miller began the long process of rebuilding, of coming to terms with the past, and of looking towards a future that, despite everything, held the promise of peace. Years had passed since the end of the war, and the world had changed in countless ways. Cities had been rebuilt, nations had reformed, and the geopolitical landscape had shifted dramatically. Yet for those who had lived through the war, its echoes lingered, a constant reminder of what had been lost and what had been gained. Hauptmann Friedrich Miller had returned to his hometown, where he found not just the physical scars of war, but also the enduring spirit of its people. He had taken up a modest job, a far cry from his days as a military officer, but it gave him a sense of purpose, a way to contribute to the rebuilding of his country. Friedrich often found himself walking by the river, the same river he had crossed in those final desperate days of the war. It flowed just as it always had, indifferent to the history it had witnessed, but for Friedrich, it was a place of deep reflection. He thought about his journey, the men he had led, and the choices he had made. He thought about the cost of war, the lives lost, and the shadows it cast over the survivors. He wondered about the other side, about the soldiers he had fought against, and hoped that they too were finding some peace in the aftermath. As he walked, he sometimes met others like himself, former soldiers from both sides of the conflict, now older, their youthful zeal replaced by a more contemplative demeanor. They would nod to each other, a silent acknowledgement of shared experience, a mutual understanding of the past that shaped them. Friedrich also dedicated time to speaking at schools and community centers, sharing his experiences not to glorify the war, but to ensure that the lessons of the past were not forgotten. He spoke of the importance of peace, of understanding, and of the need to work together to prevent the horrors of war from ever happening again. His family, too, had healed in their own way. 
They had grieved for lost loved ones, rebuilt their home, and found new routines. But the war had changed them as it had changed everything. There was a new appreciation for the simple joys of life, a deeper understanding of the fragility of peace, and a constant effort to cherish and protect it. As the years turned into decades, the world continued to evolve, but the memories of the war remained, a poignant part of history that continued to influence the present. Veterans' reunions, memorial services, and historical documentaries all served as reminders of the past, of the sacrifices made, and the need to remain vigilant against the forces of division and conflict. For Friedrich, the journey from the war's end to the quiet life he now led was long and often difficult. He had grappled with guilt, grief, and the challenge of adjusting to a new world. But he had also found a sense of redemption in his efforts to contribute to a better future, a future where the echoes of the Elba were a reminder not of division, but of the enduring hope for peace and reconciliation. And so, as the sun set over the river, casting long shadows and golden light across the water, Friedrich Miller, former Hauptmann and survivor of a war that had shaped a century, stood watching the flow, a man at peace with his past, committed to the future, and forever changed by the echoes of history.